Okay, welcome back to Oracle Open World. This is live in San Francisco. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Valley Jones, Stu Miniman from Wikibon. We're here with Dan Hushin, CTO at CSC, one of the main sponsors here at Oracle, obviously a big player. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks very much, John. Great to have you on. Obviously, we were just talking prior to coming on, your history going back into the 90s into the client server world, when it was growing like crazy with Sun Microsystems. Now that's part of the Oracle engineered solutions, part of the Red Stack. Uh, obviously now CSC, you guys have visibility into a lot of the trends, you're on the bleeding edge, cutting edge, and also kind of in the stable area with the big, the big enterprises and service providers. Um, yeah. Oracle always seems to introduce things right at the right time, right? You know, like yeah. it's very uh, timing. Timing's everything. Um, and, and, and some say they're late to the party, some say they're, they're just in time. Um, cloud and big data, DevOps, security have really been a cutting edge topic. I want to jump in with you and, and, and ask you one, how is Oracle doing here at this show um, <laughs> this, this year relative to being relevant in those areas? And what are the core issues that you think they're missing? Boy, what are they missing? That's a tough one. Let me start with where they're really good. So, you know, in my mind, um, Oracle's got some, you know, maintained some core strengths, right? You got to start with the developer because nothing matters if the developer doesn't care. Right, so uh, you know the Java One conference being here is is still a massive draw. Even as Ruby and others uh, start to peel away, right, you can't discount Java, still the leading language in the industry. And you know, quite honestly, across our global customer base, Java is front and center. Most of the transformations we do from COBOL on the mainframe, right, land in Java. So so it's there. You know. Uh, Data is the, the next most important thing. In fact, Java comes to manipulate the data. So, you know, they're a big memory system, right? Some might say late, some might say just in time. You know, the fact of the matter is that just like everything. I think it's good timing on the memory. I think it's good. I mean, it's good timing there. Yeah. It's early still on memory. I, I agree. So that's great stuff. You know, the exadata, you know, putting larger storage, high, uh, high load speeds, high analyst speeds, right? It's the center of everything our enterprises are looking to do. Um, that'll, that's becoming mainstream now, right? It started in marketing around customer. We're seeing it now move into HR and other segments of the business, right? That's, that's a pretty cool time when you're actually looking at people, hiring people using big data. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's coming front and center. Um, you know, in terms of gaps, you know, it's, it's hard to pick one out. You know, being at EMC, I might point out the fact that, you know, high availability storage is still a challenge for a lot of people, but, uh, you know, they have some pretty good solutions there too. It seems that everyone's chipping away at replication and disaster recovery. It's an easy, low-hanging fruit, hard problems to solve, but yet it seems to be a safe thing to knock down with virtualization in these environments. Do you agree? I agree. You know, uh, virtualization is kind of a saving grace. Virtualizing data is going to be more and more important. Um, I, would, I would even you know, go one step further and say, you know, fundamentally what we actually have to do is begin to figure out um, uh, you know, how, how do we actually begin to version control data you know, past replication. Um, so you know, all these version controlled file systems or, or version controlled databases are coming out, the update in place is beginning to go away. It's really changing the physics of how databases are being designed. So there's some comments on Twitter just say, OpenStack for Solera is coming in the future. Update, um, so comment on the evolution <laughs> of, of OpenStack. I mean, OpenStack's captured the hearts and minds of CIOs and staff in IT because of the, it feels like Amazon, I can program my own and build my own private, public, uh, private hybrid public cloud. So comment about OpenStack, and is Java that relevant in the DevOps world? I mean, Java, you mentioned, obviously is a mainstay, you know, for anyone uh, who's been programming over the years, it's been a great language, but for the new school coming in, yep. Java's not top of mind. I mean, they want, you know, they don't load Linux packs anymore. These young, young guys at the cloud are just fully integrated stacks. Mm -hmm. They want things turnkey. So, you know, I think multivisor is going to be the way that the industry's going to go, right? I, I, I can't help but say that it's, uh, you still got livestock and you still got pets. You know, and you name your pets, and you take care of your pets, and you're willing to spend the extra money on their food. You know, then you got your livestock over here, you're cheap and deep, right? Big data has some nasty, nasty properties that goes cold. And I don't want to pay for that license when the data's cold. So, you know, I'm still seeing a horses for courses kind of model out there in the hypervisor space. Um, what Oracle's going to do, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, hopefully they're participating in the community, they're a pretty open company. Um, you know, in terms of languages uh, and, and DevOps, uh, you know, I love Ruby. I'm a big Ruby fan, big Python fan. Um, you know, I, I think that declarative languages make a lot of sense, and uh, you know, I don't think the DevOps landscape has to move to to Java in order to be to allow developers to be uh, really proficient in, uh, in in across their DevOps landscape. So you're saying, I mean, Python and Ruby are great examples of what the developers are using, and they're used to programming on that. And we always talk about the enablement of what that means. So mm -hmm. what's under the hood relative to those? When I say under the hood, you know, what core scale is available to them? And Amazon's proven that, hey, we'll integrate underneath those languages, make things you know, easy to automate and just automatically integrating in. 
Yeah. How's that play out in an OpenStack and an Oracle environment? Obviously, OpenStack being kind of like an IT and Oracle being a huge install base in the enterprise. How does that mindset, does it work? Does it compute? Does it work? How do you, how do you uh, talk about that when you talk to clients? Uh, you know, it, uh, <laughs> it's a little of everything. Um, you know, some customers are, are really you know, focused in and, and sitting here and saying, hey, uh, you know, all that I'm looking for is to pull hands off keyboards. You know, DevOps is really a model that allows me to do continuous integration and continuous delivery. That's really good. You got small mobility projects. DevOps is going to allow you to roll four times a day into production. That's awesome. You got a whole nother set of uh, constituents in the landscape who are looking at aspect-oriented programming techniques that allow you to do just-in-time insertion of code without into a runtime system. You can't quite get there from a DevOps standpoint, and so you know, fundamentally, the Java Camp comes forward with AOP styles and. And, and fundamentally enables that. So again, I, I think that we're going to see a, a fairly wide uh, range of technologies, and I think it's going to depend on where in the stack you're actually working. You're working on the front end, you're probably working on in Ruby JSON. You're working on the back end, you're probably working in Java. Uh, no, that's just me. Yeah, so Dan, when I, I think back to, you know, when John founded SiliconANGLE, things they talked about, cloud, mobile, social, big data, some of the themes we're really seeing Oracle talking about here. Um, your presentation that you gave here at the conference was talking about uh, bringing the outside in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to the enterprise. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know you're a huge proponent of open source, uh, things like blogging and social, so can you explain what does this mean, this, this outside in for the enterprise mean? Yeah, so, um, you know, we published a research piece uh, with, uh, with an analyst group that we have internally called the Leading Edge Forum. And uh, the research piece was called Outside In. The, the net was that, um, you know, fundamentally, if you wanted to put it into colloquial terms, right, the, the internet is the new land, right? And we're beginning to see that the data landscape inside the enterprise um, uh, is now is a soft, gooey center protected by a firewall. It's a fortress model, and everybody recognizes we've got to move. Um, you know, the big data solutions, by and large, that are out there are work group level solutions. So we got to find ways to begin to enclave our data, enclave our applications. This is really changing the way that we're doing business. It just so happens, this is exactly what you do when you actually work as an IT group with an external service provider like Salesforce. You have to worry about enclave security. You got to be able to protect the link. And inside of our enterprise, we don't do that. And that's becoming a massive problem for things like advanced persistent threats. So what we're looking at is these open cultures, um, uh, the new insights that are coming from the outside world, much more intelligence coming from the outside into the enterprise than, than the insight might even, you know, the in, you know, inside enterprise might actually deliver on their own, right? And this is all about being customer centric, whether the customer is a true, uh, you know, revenue generating customer or an employee. It's giving them what they need to be effective in the marketplace and dealing with mass personalization versus one size fits all. Yeah, I, I love that internet's the new land. It really sounds like echoes of what Sun used to talk about, the network's the new computer. Um, Security is, is such a hot topic. I mean, even though we always said security was always top of mind, but not necessarily the first thing that people would spend money on. Right. With everything that's going on with the NSA and Prism, you know, what, what's your take? What is the security landscape these days? Well, I, I think it's really heating up. Um, you know, advanced persistent threats are everywhere. If you haven't been attacked, then you just don't know it yet. Um, and so what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, we launched a couple interesting services this year. Uh, one is a logical SIM. Uh, so we, we have a logical SEM, or a logical SOC, which is a security operations center in multiple countries globally. So now we can deal with global enterprise, give them the right kind of perspective. Now what we're actually doing is bringing some global threat overlay data on top of those logical SOCs, almost like the, the point that John made about you know, virtual data. We're actually providing you now a, a logical you know, storage landscape, to, or a, a security landscape across the, uh, across the portfolio. Customers are eating that up because uh, security, the information behind security matters at scale, and that scale is going to help us, I think, address the, the larger needs of the customer base. So, so, so Dan, I'm wondering if I could ask you a personal question. You know, you, you, you came from Sun, you went to EMC, uh, I knew you when you started out in the grid, and that kind of morphed into some of the cloud aspects, and now you went to CSC, who, you know, a lot of us were a little bit surprised uh, when CSC was mentioned as, you know, in one of the major analyst firms said, one of the leaders in infrastructure as a service. You know, so can you lay out for us, you know, what, what brought you to CSC, and you know, how are you driving, what, you know, what, what's changing for CSC in this new cloud era? So great, you know, awesome, Stu. Uh, for me, the, the critical aspect was uh, uh, staying closer to the customers. Right, uh, one, of the, one of the key things for me that, uh, that I really was missing working for a core technology vendor is that by and large with their focus on channel strategy, we were moving two steps back from the customer 
And as a result, I was losing my early warning system with respect to how these technologies were actually out there really solving key customer problems. So for me, the, uh, the, the move to CSC was a step forward in the marketplace. Um, and, and then what was really interesting is that we have exactly the same incubators that I was working on inside of EMC. And so now I'm actually beginning to understand the nuanced messages. So we had built the coarse grain messages at, at both cloud that I did at Sun and then cloud that I did uh, you know, with the team at EMC, or, or big data at both companies as well, now bring that forward and understanding how the nuanced messages are applying in vertical markets. Yeah, and talk about, uh, since we're on the personal thread here, um, the inflection point magnitude, magnitude of what was going on in this world. You said, talk to the customer, obviously you want to get in the front lines and, and see kind of the action up close. Um, you know, Sun was a big player in that client server as when Oracle and SAP were born in those days. Yep. And that inflection point of client server is really probably one of the closest uh, after, and then the internet also came, the web was obviously another oh, yeah. one, but sure. what's it like now? Compare and contrast the inflection point, kind of the, the perfect storm of what's happening now in terms of change, enablement, acceleration. How could you talk about that for the folks out there? Share with them your opinion on kind of what's going on right now that's different or maybe unforeseen or just give an order of magnitude of the kinds of uh, change that we're seeing. Uh, you know, the, the change is massive. I mean, web protocols won, right? REST won, HTML5 is winning. Uh, you know, just like everything in the old Java world, right? You'd write in Java and optimize in native code, right? We're seeing write in HTML5, write in J JSON, optimize in, in custom apps. Uh, we're seeing, uh, I think, finally for the for the right time and first time, a bifurcation of uh, of the uh, a view controller, right, which drives the mobile clients, right, from the model controller, which is the back office present, presentment of information. And before those had kind of been woven together into fat apps, and we're now really seeing that the technologies have matured to the point where we're seeing those pull apart. So it is really real that we're seeing, you know, Ruby and and JSON on the front end with a set of RESTful eyes into uh, uh, RESTful APIs into back end services. This means CIO have to begin to worry about putting APIs on all of their core internal systems to, to really drive to the new experience that the customers are requiring, which are naturally mashing up the back office data for forward presentment. I mean, and if you add another dimension, Dave and I always talk about like with Flash, with David Floyer, you got Flash, you got Compute, you have basically almost limitless resource on the Compute side now. Yep. Um, you talk about grid, I mean, I think the grid vision back in the early, early of the decade was very similar to what's happening right now in terms of the, the kinds of distributed scale. Yeah. So even under the hood, there's still massive uh, infrastructure improvements on top of with virtualization. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, software yeah. rules, John. Yeah. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, software rules. You know, we're, we are seeing some of the high availability architectures begin to give way with more and more of their workloads to the, uh, to the commodity scale infrastructure. Right, we're seeing web scale kind of begin to take over because the elasticity and the availability that it has the ability to afford. Right, it also gives you the, the maximum degree of, of cost capability in, in terms of managing your cost versus quality, especially if you can do that with DevOps and software. Yeah, Dan, speaking of software, CSC made an acquisition of InfoChimps. I wonder if you can lay out for us you know, where that fits into the ecosystem. Uh, Pivotal's right down the block. They've been uh, you know, making some big announcements uh, sure. with regard to platform as a service. Can you walk, walk us through that? Yeah, so you know, uh, per my uh, statement that I'm, I'm really into DevOps and service automation, what I really liked about InfoChimps was uh, two things. So one with they're doing real-time fast data, so big fast data, and that they had this thing called Cloud Streams, and Cloud Streams gave us the ability to, uh, to fundamentally deal with stream processing through Storm and Kafka um, as a DevOps procured asset, right? And then we had Cloud Query and, and, uh, and Cloud Search, and all of them were linked together. And, and you know, my, data, my vision has been, hey, I need to do forensic analytics on the back, and I need to do uh, 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 complex event processing on the front. They do that all with a push button provisioning model onto Amazon. And so for me, what InfoChimps was, was a harvesting of open source with a new set of DevOps styles to help me orchestrate an information pipeline through a landscape. And that was an Accu hire too, right? You guys pretty much got the team with that whole deal. We did, the, the team is absolutely remarkable down there. I mean, uh, Drew and Flip and Jim and, and the whole team are, are just uh, awesome, yeah. Joe. Well, we're big fans of those guys. We've been tracking those guys. Obviously, we have our own little big data practice, been following the work that they've done. They've been very impressive on what they've done from day one, you know, even just mining all the social data as well as dealing with a lot of the, the challenges around we'll discovery. We'll set you up an account on InfoChimps if you'd like, John. Yeah, we'd love it, we'd all love right. it. Okay, uh, final question, you're, uh, and then Stu, if you have a final question, I'll let you go, but if not, uh, we'll end it there. But final question is, what's your take of Oracle going forward? Can they drive the bus to the place they need to be? Um, and can they continue to innovate? They're going to hold the line. Can they keep their customers? Can they 
vertically integrate the red stack? Can they, can they bring that into the environments? And, and what are they going to give up? I mean, how do you see the, the playbook for Oracle evolving? You know, I, 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 I wish I had the magic answer to that. I, you know, I, I think that, good. I think that they're, um, <laughs> you know, they're fundamentally innovating in the right areas, right? They're building on software instead of hardware. I think that that's a massive plus. They still control the developer landscape. I think that's going to allow them to move cleanly into mobility and, and the new information sources. Um, you know, I think the future is pretty bright for those guys. Uh, they have some of the, the right properties. I think they need some more moves uh, to get much closer to the customer and solve some of the customer problems. Hopefully that's what CSC is going to do for them. All right, so Dan, I do have a final question for you. If, if you talk to the CIOs out there in the community, uh, I, I think you know, one of the challenges out there is some of them say, you know, I, I don't necessarily have the developers, I don't have the data scientists, and I'm just doing things the way that I've been doing things for a long time. What's your advice to them? How do they move forward? Oh God. Yeah. I, I, you know, I wish there was a great answer. I think the, the number one thing that I have is, uh, is I'm telling my team to get involved in open source. Um, because if there's one way to learn, it's through watching the conversations that are occurring in open source communities, right? It's, it's really easy to say that I have a training that I established inside my culture, but if you really want to change your culture, you got to let your people go outside in. You got to let them go and execute in the open community and to bring those talent, skills, the people that they know, um, and, uh, and both the pitfalls as well as the successes back into the company to help accelerate. Dan, thanks for coming inside the queue. In the front lines with customers here at CSC, CTO, a lot of great background, obviously very relevant. You guys are, do some great work, and, uh, and customers are moving fast, so thanks for coming inside the queue, yeah. sharing your opinion. Uh, we'll be right back with our next guest after the short break. This is the Cube live in San Francisco, Oracle Open World 2013, our fourth consecutive year since the Cube was born. We're excited to be here. Stay with us. We'll be right back with our next guest on day one of three days of live coverage, wall to wall at Oracle Open. We'll be right back.